Oh, hello everybody and welcome to another Caddy Cube Tuesdays. Today it's with Barnaby Winter and we are apparently live on YouTube, on Periscope and on Facebook. Uh, first things first, Barnaby gets the song. A quick hello and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Barnaby Winter. Welcome. You didn't warn me about that one, that's for certain. No, that's part of the fun, is it's a surprise. I've actually got a gallery of photos of people as they listen to me sing. Um, <laughs> and it's usually better when it's face-to-face -face because I get cool. a bit more overexcited. But uh, one thing I do love, other than the fact that you're the brand bucket, is I do love the name Barnaby Winter. It's one of those kind of terribly English, terribly poetic, terribly singy kind of names. And it's pretty unique, isn't it? It certainly is. I think there is only other one other Barnaby Winter. There might be another one actually has emerged recently on on the great interweb, and oh, uh, right. so. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so I was I was I named after a Barnaby, but obviously the Winter is uh, is a family name. So. It's imposed. Yeah, the the Winter is imposed. Right. Oh, if we show the brand set, I mean, my thing is brand set. So I looked you up. I looked at what Google shows, and obviously you dominate it because there aren't very many. I actually found two, but your brand set is actually quite. Uh, dull, if I may say so. Uh, you've got the blue links there. We don't have videos. We don't have the knowledge panel. Um, and, and you know, it, you control it. But I would, I would suggest maybe you could get more videos, and hopefully this video will help to trigger that. Then I started looking to see if I could find some other ones. Do you dominate it because you're really good at SEO or because the competition is low? And it turns out it's because the competition is low. We've got a musician and teacher and then a guy for a student at the University of Hull who doesn't even want to put his photo up, which says a lot. Uh, and then I looked on Facebook and the guy, the musician and teacher there, here he is, uh, absolutely beautiful rendition of some Paul Simon song that I couldn't identify. I listened to the whole thing and I d I've got no idea what song it was. Which one is Barnaby, do you think? Oh, that's a very good question. I should know, actually. He, uh... Well, while you're thinking about it, I mean, what the thing about it is, is they recorded this live online. And if you think about how difficult that must be, because yes. you've got everyone in their room, there's this delay and singing with other people in tune and in time is now an impossible. There is actually software to do that. So, uh, but it's an amazing, amazing recording. And Barnaby's the guy with his head tilted there in the middle. Yes, the, big, the big one, I guess if it was one at all, it would be the bigger one. Yeah. yeah, he's the star of the show, just like you today. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, talking of star of the show, you're the brand bucket, um, which sounds rather less poetic than Barnaby Winter. Yes, so but it's it's a trademark methodology that was developed for Saab in 1985 by an, a, a gentleman called Stuart Ball. He used it to create a, a top 40 advertising agency. He sold that agency to Saatchi and Saatchi, but kept the brand bucket as a methodology and started an agency which I joined in 1999. Uh, becoming the youngest MD of the top 200 agency at the time. So it's a methodology that absolutely maps out how people engage with your business. Right, okay. So it's not a bucket as in you throw all these brands into a bucket, shake them up, and and that tells you which one's going to be the best. It's a bit more interesting no, than that. No, it, it's, it's actually a six-step engagement model which has uh, mm. mathematical drop-off rates from each step. So the the shape you end up with is a, is a, is a bucket shape. Oh, and, and the mathematical drop-offs, are they the same for everybody? Is it is it they a are, universal uh, law? It would appear to be broadly a universal law. We've uh, we've tested over a thousand different brand brands and their respective campaigns, and it would appear that mathematically the drop-off rates tend to be exactly the same, whether it's FMCG or technology or slow moving goods or charity or whatever, that there, there tends to be a, a, a similar drop-off rate. Right, so we're talking about any size of brand, any industry, and any country? Uh, certainly, it would appear to work globally as well. Yeah, exactly the same thing. Blooming hack, you've got gold in your hands, man. It certainly has helped us immensely over the last 35 years plan marketing campaigns for, for different organisations. Can I, can I jump ahead like quite a long way, probably? Does it help you stop wasting money on steps that you know you cannot improve because of the drop-off rate is more or less written in stone? I think that's absolutely right. I think where there's been a, a, a slight change at the very top of the bucket, but um, uh, and so therefore we're less able to manage that for obvious reasons because of the new digital knowledge economy. But the right. the bottom of the bucket certainly, and the, the trick here is of course to start at the bottom, not at the top. Whereas most most marketing 
media start at the top so so okay. that money is wasted <clears throat> can, can we come back to that because i like that we've got six steps and we can go from bottom to top instead of top to bottom of but course. you mentioned digital because he started it this mr ball started it in 84 so that was pre-digital you bought it in 99 which was beginning of digital How, have the drop-off percentages changed through so that certain, period they absolutely don't appear to have done what has wow. changed is the source of uh, the initial engagement. So where, where before we were able to absolutely map out what numbers we needed to bring people into the top of the bucket, now we're happy to just uh, accept the millions of impressions and clicks and things like that. They're, they're less of less concern. But the important part of it is, is you're only going to get the, the right number coming in to feed the bottom of the bucket. And that's where I think you can save a lot of money. Okay, and just one question then. The impressions, the visibility of your brand isn't the step at the top of the bucket. That's pre the step of the bucket. That's not outside really, the bucket. Not really, because I think uh, 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 we class an impression as an interaction with your, your brand experience. So you must be managing that as much as everything else. Uh, if, you, if you just hand it out to the great unwashed from a media point of view, then you have no control of where people are coming from. And that's something that we, we fundamentally are, are trying to enable business owners to understand mm -hmm. brand owners to understand that they can control how people get into their bucket <laughs> we can control how people get into our bucket i mean out of context that would sound really bizarre uh, it, i sound bizarre most of the time to be honest jason so oh, right, really good <laughs> that 100 percent suits me uh, but the thing about digital is you you lose a great deal of control i'm trying to imagine pre-digital because i mean pre-digital i was still at school pretty much um and there, there was a certain level of control. I think brands felt that they controlled their message. They controlled how people would see them. Uh, whereas today, the, the, once you put it out there, you've got no control. No, I don't think that's true because I think no. once you understand how people make decisions, you can control their decision making. And uh, mm. there, is a, there is a particular way of doing that. So, uh, Which is that your secret sauce that you won't share or a secret no, sauce that you will share but right at the end? No, no, I, I'm happy to share it because I, I think it's it being a secret is of no use to anybody. The, the, the essence is what's, what's changed about buying decisions now is that, that and this is all backed by research. So if you, if you go into uh, uh, Gartner and CB and the Challenger customer and the Challenger yeah. sale, you'll find that actually there, there is, they have identified that at the point of first contact, with your business you, the buyer has made 57 percent of the decision to buy so that means they've been through a journey where wow. they've already made a decision to buy from you they're more likely to buy from you than not buy from you and this is a fundamental shift in the way marketing and that can have an impact on the but that, that's the first time they see my brand yes they are more likely to buy it than not buy it Oh, that doesn't seem reasonable. No, 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 hold on. It's not the first time they see it, the first time they interact with you directly. So if... Right, if, okay. So, so it's at the point they ask you about your products and services, they have made 57% of the decision to buy. That's not... No, that's absolutely not the first time they've seen it, no. Right, okay. No, excuse me. Yeah, I think I was, yeah, I was misinterpreting they will, they will what you were saying. They will have seen your brand story many multiple times prior to that to, to right. get to 57%. Well, that begs the incredibly obvious and probably very stupid question. If you have a really rubbish person explaining what your brand is offering, wouldn't that 57% become 42% because they're explaining it badly? I know the, 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 the logic train is at the point of contact, you, they've made 57% of the decision. If, you, if they've only made 42% of the decision, they won't make contact with you. Oh, right. I see what you mean. Excuse me. Yeah, My misunderstanding. Yeah, so it was a very point. stupid question. Yeah. So they haven't got to the point where they're sufficiently convinced. So if you've got if you've got bad sales messages going out there, people just won't come to you. I love that. So they won't contact me until they've fifty seven percent decided to 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 buy from me, and then it's up to right. me to figure out how to go from that fifty seven percent of decision through to a hundred percent. Right, and and which is already a great insight because it does mean so I need to pay much more attention to people who actually reach out to me because those yeah. are phenomenally important people. Because yeah, and, we, and what 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 often happens is is because businesses don't realize this strategically they then hose pipe the people that make contact with them with all their their features and how great they are and all that right. sort of thing because they know all that so they just go actually i know all this 
So please, can we just get on with the purchase bit? And often business owners don't do that, so people then drift away again. Um, and that's very dangerous. I just thought of something, sorry. Because um, when people search your brand name, which is my thing, brand search, what appears when somebody Googles your brand name? Um, basically, you've got clients, journalists, potential hires, so on and so forth. And then you've got prospects. Now, what you're saying to me is the point at which a prospect searches the brand name, they're already well on the way to making a decision to buy from me. Um, Fifty-seven percent. Would that count in the digital world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, for a start, they, how did they come across your name? Why are yeah. they searching your name? Actually, if they're searching a, a, a Google term, how did they choose that Google term? We don't just wake up and randomly type terms into into search engines, do we? Unless we, we're completely mad. Yeah. Well, okay. And, and there's there's some debate I know amongst the people watching about us two talking, but the, the reality <laughs> of this, the reality of this that you you. Here's how it works. You wake up in the morning and you have a challenge, an issue, something you need to resolve, a problem, whatever you want to do. What, what right. would be the first thing you do with that that problem? What would be the first thing you do? Yeah. You search Google and the idea is Google's bringing the solution, and bringing again, the answer. Research, if you if you look at Mary Meeker from Kleiner Perkins, if you look at the e-commerce foundation, they are yeah. saying that up to, up to 88% of buying decisions start online. So, okay, and that kind of makes sense. It's probably even more so now we're in the pandemic world where none of us are leaving our computers. Mm. And so, so you put your problem into, into, uh, into a Google or whatever, and what happens is, is if, if nothing appears on the front page at all, you've typed your problem in, you probably need to go and see a doctor because you're the only person in the world that's got that problem. Yep. But the reality is the screen fills up with lots of choices. There may be hundreds of thousands of things. So what you then do is you ignore the ads at the top because they're trying to sell you something and you go into the organics and you might get to page two, but it's unlikely. And very quickly, in a very short space of time, you've kind of got a shopping list, you've qualified your problem that is real, you've seen people have thrown up a load of solutions, and now you're quite far in to to wanting to talk to someone about can they solve your problem yeah and, right. and what's the best way to solve their problem and, and we're only two or three minutes into the decision making process at this point yeah we, well that's the thing about online is we're only two or three minutes in because that's the other thing is people search for example a generic term like red shoes with laces and they will visit multiple sites and check them out they Correct. will see the brands and that's when they start making that decision but then when they search the brand it means that they're well on the way to making that decision yeah, you found you found two or three pairs of red shoes with laces do you think actually i might buy those so now you go in and by the time you're clicking on the website or or visiting the Amazon or visiting the eBay or going into a retail store online, you're pretty well decided to buy. Now, actually, it's about nurturing that that desire to buy over the line so that you can get money out of people. Right. Now, that brings me to another question, uh, all still about brand sets. Basically, we've got this person, they've researched. Now they've searched my brand name because they've decided that they're probably going to buy from me. They search my brand name, they click on the link, they come to my home page. That home page is therefore, A, not the final destination for them on my site, and B, its function is to reassure them about who I am and what I do and that they're probably in the right place and to signpost them where they want to go. Is that a fair assessment of a home page? Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so if, if, if you're in a straight product sales scenario, then you must make it easy to buy right there and then. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't befuddle them with with stuff that they don't need to know, um, and you know your history and how long you've been going and all that sort of. Just 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 don't do that. Just say, look, if you want to buy here, you can buy. But equally, what for most businesses, and if we're talking about service industries in a B two B context or or in, even in a B two C context, what you should be offering is the ability for them to try you out. Oh right, okay. To have a test drive to do something where you're physically doing something together with the, with the prospect. Because it's at that point that the whole bonding process goes on between the buyer and you, the, the, the brand owner. And so what you, what you need to be doing is effectively make your website a booking site for test drives or, or give people the opportunity to buy directly if they, if they feel they're confident enough to do oh, that. Right. No, okay. I think that's going to be my my quote from this. Is you know, I mean, obviously, test drive make make it uh, uh, easy for them to contact me to start that relationship because it's by starting that relationship that I can hope to move from fifty seven percent to one hundred percent. If I never start that uh, exchange, I'm never likely to move because they've already understood my message by the time they've got there. Is that correct? Fair? And actually, and, and actually, overwhelming them with more stuff that they don't need to know because they're already in buying mode. So what you've got is you've got to nurture them through, hold their hand, and say, look, you know. 
thank you so much for coming here. You're right. You're in the right place. So just to reassure you on that, that dovetails into everything we've been talking about or you've seen of us prior to this. And what would you like? Would you like to, to, to try the product? Do you want to have access to it for a short period of time? Do you want to talk to someone, an expert in our organization, just to find out you're making the right decision? Do you, or do you want to just sure. buy it? And actually, it should feel like, a, you know, if you, it should genuinely feel like you walked into a store knowing what you're going to buy inside the store. Oh, I like that. That's a really good analogy. Brilliant. Genius. Because we all understand that. Uh, right. Okay. That um, that means I'm going to have to go and redesign my entire site. And I think a lot of people watching this are now going to think, oh, that's one of the challenges when I talk like this. Yes, but but uh, starting with your homepage is probably a good place to start because that's the crux of it. That That's the chunk of people who have already almost made the decision. I had a client talk to me the other day and they had a big picture of somebody on a bike and it was actually difficult to figure out where to buy from. They were saying, yeah, but we want to convince them that we're wonderful. And I was trying to point out to them, not as eloquently as you are, they already know you're wonderful. They know what you do. They just want to buy. Yes, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. My site is crap. And now I'm wondering if Anton's saying my site is crap or his site is crap. I hope it's his. I, I think where, you know, clearly when, 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 when uh, you know, the online arena sprung out, it was very tempting to use that as an alternative to brochures. And I think we're still seeing a hangover from the broken right. web generation, which is, which is where I think we need to really recognize that all the, all the, the advent of all of the search engines and the, and the LinkedIn's and the Facebook's and the Instas and all this, all these different ways in YouTube that that's now replaced uh, the need for your website to do all that heavy lifting. Now, now you can make your head, your website much more about, thank you for getting here. How do we do business together? What can I do to, to, right. you know, no, I, I love that. That's genius. You're, you're, you're very smart, aren't you? Um, I, I do like the, the, the brochure hangover that the we're having. And I think that's a really good way of putting it because it makes me understand it very quickly that it's something I need to get rid of. And I do agree with you. And coming from an SEO perspective, I've always looked at a site as a way to present my products, as a way to present my clients' products. Yes. Uh, and in fact, you're right. Uh, and it's what I'm now trying to push out to people is that the contact points are multiple and bef beforehand. Correct. And what I hadn't realized is quite how far down that decision-making process people are when they finally get that. Yeah, and in, in our model, it's, the, it's effectively comes into play around about the, the fourth step. Um, so, so uh, um, Maybe this is a good time then to start with the, 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 hang on, what's it gonna be? It's gonna be the sixth one because we're going from the bottom to the yeah, top. Okay, yeah, okay, so, so if you assume that your business is a bucket, Jason and the, the objective. <laughs> Sorry, you, not. I just thought crap bucket because I just saw the word crap. So that that's really crap, put me off. Get you stimulated. So it looks like <laughs> your business. Okay, right, easy like to it. understand for an idiot like me. Right. Thank you very now, much. Yes. Right. Now the, 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 we we have two we have two swear words in our organisation. One begins with F and one begins with C. And the the first swear word is. Um, often people talk about the, the a thing that's like like a bucket, but it has a hole in the bottom. And uh, you'll hear them; they're called. I'll, I'll have to. I'll, I'll swear once, and I do apologise for. It's all right, I don't mind. Okay, well, so it's the funnel, right? The funnel is a swear word in our business because it's got a whacking great right. hole in the bottom, and it was it's part of the fraud of the broadcast industry to pour loads of leads into the top of the F word and let watch them all pour out on the floor and keep getting you to spend money with them. Actually, the principle of, of, uh, of a vessel, of a bucket, is you're trying to keep everybody in the bottom. And that defines your business. Yeah, the number of people who are regularly buying from you. So the bottom step right. is what we call loyalty. And it's, it's block the hole with a big plug. Well, correct. Okay, you can block the hole with a big plug, but you might be better off using one of these. To be fair, so all right, not have the hole in the first place <laughs> might be better. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, the idea is the, the step one is get once, people are in your bucket, keep them in your bucket. Yeah, keep keep them and actually look after them. So there's a whole strategy around that because if you keep uh, adding value to people who buy from you, even though you think there's a cost to it, actually what happens is they buy more stuff from you. And more importantly, they become your advocate and they tell other people about you. So that that form, we call that loyalty. So we, we, we give that the name loyalty. And on your marketing plan, you should have the word loyalty. What are the campaigns that you're actively talking to uh, your your regular buyers, the infrequent buyers, and you're talking to them all of the time? So that's the first thing. That, that right. to, get, to get them to be loyal, what you've got to do is what we call usage, which is the first step post-purchase. So effectively, this is you make your experience amazing. So once people give you their money, 
they have a real sense of what you're offering as a brand because their whole expectation and money is a, a, a a currency of one thing only and it's time so what they're doing is they're giving you time uh, it just comes in the form of money because they've had to spend time earning the money so when they give you a piece of money you're taking a piece of their life in exchange of a piece of yours so you need to make that feel amazing so so what you need to do is, is make your purchase experience amazing and make make owning or using your your product or service amazing so that we call that usage um, right. Can now, I just that, make a point about time? Sorry, that, that my, yeah, my yeah, wife told me years and years ago, she had a friend who said, uh, you can do what you want, but never make me wait. Because yes. when I wait, I lose time. It's the only thing I cannot replace. Yes, and I think that's time right. Time is precious. Sorry. I mean, it, it, I, I like that idea of people who make you wait because they're late all the time. Yeah. I, I now have become very frustrated with that, even though I yeah, am. Now, if, if, if I said, if I... Uh, so there's a way around that. It's re really interesting. So if I say to you, and often some businesses do that, if we are late, right, we're going to give you money. Right. Okay. Okay. So for example, if there are certain certain retailers where if they're late delivering the the meal, the meal's free or whatever. That yeah. actually compensates for being late because what they're doing is they're giving you your time back, but they're giving right. it in the form of money. So they might be giving free products or services. So there, if if you have a a business system or process that is prone to slippage yeah, yeah. then then build into it a, a a return of money as a compensation for the time that you're wasting then people are never upset they okay. just never uh, well one question return of money is is that not considered by some people to be a little bit dirty and you'd do better returning services or providing something right. extra okay i mean what, what no, no it's a question sorry i'm not trying to bully you and be nasty to you for the purposes of this, I'm trying to simplify this. If you can have, add that level of sophistication where you give people a choice, you can say either you can have right. money back or you can have extra dough balls or you can, <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever it is, yeah, then give people the choice. Of course, the more right. okay. the more dynamic your, 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 your tool is, your business system process, then give people the choice. I think that's wonderful. And people will talk about you because they will come away not realizing that they – their expectations weren't quite met because they've been exceeded at this usage level. Yeah, so you build that into the the usage level. So that's immediately prior, uh, post purchase. Immediately prior to purchase, we're, we're now at level at step five. Yes, so we're now at level three. So we're we're halfway up. Hang, so I missed two steps. Hang on, we've got six, five, four, and we're now at three. And no, no, I missed no, five, no, and four. No, okay, just to explain, Jason, we're coming up from the bottom. We've got loyalty at the bottom. Above that, we've right. got usage. And now we have the purchase, and now we're, which isn't a step; it's just a, a process, a transactional process. Now above that is step number three of with still another four, three to go on top of that. Okay, so we now. I, I, I like I like the way you explained it as though you were talking a complete idiot. I just missed them because you didn't explicitly say this is step six, this is step five, this is step four. No, no, because you asked three. me to do it the wrong way around. I normally do it from the top down, so it's, I'm doing it from the bottom up. So, so. But you so told me, you told me right at the beginning, yeah, we come from the bottom up. No, we plan uh, our marketing uh, strategies from the bottom up, but actually the model is top down because, of course, you're unaware, but you wanted it done that way. So I'm doing it in reverse. Just Brilliant. I love this. This is completely oh, – yeah, okay. Now, step number three, the wrong way around. Right, the wrong way around. So go up from the bottom. I'll explain them back down the other way. Uh, <laughs> is, is the test drive. So you must push everybody that makes any inquiry into a test drive scenario. Uh, we call this response on our model. So in other, in other words, what you have to do is when a prospect engages with you, you have to elicit a direct one-to-one -one response. And there are loads and loads of ways of doing that. That can be downloading a white paper, doing a quiz, filling out a, a questionnaire. Uh, it could be talking to an expert. It could be uh, watching education videos in exchange for their emails. So there are lots and lots of ways of doing that, literally hundreds of ways of, of creating a response. I have never come across a business that cannot run some kind of test drive ever in, in the whole of my 35-year career. So, so, so you're running effectively a test drive. Um, to get people into a test drive, they have to have visited you. They have to have contacted you. Right. Um, and we call this fax match. And the reason why they contacted you is because they have been somehow engaged with your proposition. And they are now trying to find out whether you do what, you, what they need. And we call this fax match. So, so we're four steps up from the bottom, and it's now fax match. Because what they're looking to do is match 
your ability to solve their problem with their problem. Right. Okay. Uh, and most businesses make the mistake here of uh, they think this is where your website is. And what they do is they pack their website full of features. So you go on any law firm site and it'll tell you how many partners are, what they, what areas they cover and blah, blah, and whether they all like going hiking in the Pyrenees or whatever. There's all this nonsense on law firms. Actually, I don't need that information. What I need to know is are you any good at helping me uh, go through a breakup in my business contract situation or a divorce right. or whatever or, or, or solve a legal problem. I'm not interested in the rest of you, yeah, and all the other stuff. And so that's so what that step is about is turning your features into benefits. Right. So that whole part of the journey, just benefit laden, benefit, 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 everywhere. So when I actually engage with your business, I just want to be overwhelmed by the why you're so amazing to solve my problem, not – what your features are and how long you've been going and whether you've got a history and stuff. I'm not interested in any of that stuff, partly because I know that already. And, and, and a lot of business, and I know a lot of my clients, I mean, a lot of sites I visit is they talk about themselves and they look at it from their own point of view and, and saying, actually, just have empathy for the person coming to see you and why they might have come to see you and what you can actually do to help them. I yeah. empathy and look at it from their point of view. Is that not enough? No, it's, it's, it, no. It, so, so, we, we have a phrase, you probably have heard it before, is you must stop weeing all over your website. So if you visit a website and the word we appears anywhere right. on the website, we, we fundamentally know you've got the wrong kind of website, the wrong language, right. because I'm not interested in what you do. You know, what, so, so actually, you've got to replace that. Is, is you've got to count, you will get, you will understand, you will find this work. It's got to be, so when I read it, it's got to be about me, not about you. And yeah. that, critical to 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 that step of the journey um, I, I saw a talk uh, a couple of years ago by carl gillis that was it lucky i remembered his name really great guy from belgium uh, and he 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 tells this same idea as you know count the number of we's in a page and then yeah. uh, that's immediately a sign as as you said and he was saying that uh, i think it was a booking.com on their checkout page the moment you click on the button they say the word you 53 times or something stupid yeah. like that and he said and you don't even notice it it's incredibly well written you don't yeah. notice it uh, explicitly in your brain but you feel it sorry yeah actually well, i i use booking.com uh, page as an example of caldini's influence because what booking.com have built in every aspect of caldini's uh, uh power of influence on it so they've got i don't know who caldini is so he, he wrote a book called uh, uh called influence it's, it's a, a leading book and he He's, he's mapped out exactly what the key drivers are of influence in, in changing behavior and, and get people to buy things. And so oh. on booking.com, you've got scarcity, you've got, uh, uh, you've got information gathering, you've got, it's just a very clever site for that. And actually I use that in my keynotes when I'm talking about this and say, listen guys, if you want to do this really well, here's booking.com. So, so. Brilliant, uh, okay. And, you know, I mean, they, they have, you know, when you go on it, it says, you know, eight people have viewed this, in the last hour, three yeah. people, and you're thinking, actually, I, I need to I better hurry up and book something now because I'm not yeah, going to go there. The, the I, thing I, is, I, I I used booking a lot when I was uh, going around the world. I was being a digital nomad, so I would just stay in hotels. So I actually used it an awful lot. And you look and it says seven people booked this in the last hour, and you're going, yeah. but of course they didn't book it for the same day I'm booking it. No, exactly. No, I get but it's, I get it's, it's, it's tricky. No, sorry, but I mean, it's tricky, but it does make you feel, oh, I better hurry up. But in fact, what they're saying is not untrue. No, it's simply really. not specific. So you get the false idea and they're letting you well, believe as, that. As a keynote speaker, I often try and book the hotel that I'm speaking in, of course. And then, then you log on and it says 53 people have booked this in the last hour. And you go, oh, God, they're all, they're all going for the thing that I'm speaking at. And I'm not going to be able to stay there. I'm going to have to get a cab to the hotel I'm speaking at. So you quickly whiz on. And you don't. You can't see the price. The price is hardly visible because you know uh, because it's not a factor. And I'll, I'll talk about a bit, a little bit about pricing later on. But um, so anyway, so we're at fax match now. So we've got three steps after us: fax match, response, i.e., test drive, uh, usage, and loyalty. To get people to really um, want to find out about what it is you can do for them, i.e., your benefits, there are then two steps above that. And the first. The step immediately above it is what we call image match. And what you have to do is you have to create uh, language, imagery, and everything that is in the mind's eye of your prospect. And again, right. this fundamental change from the way web designers work and, and advertising agencies work. Because what, what 
I was trained to do in the first 15 years of my career is to build an image dimension around the brand. So the brand had an image and you and I, Jason, had to lump it or like it. That was our right. own choice because we had no control over it. That's completely reversed around now that actually we buy from people we like. But we did some research over a seven year period between 2002 and 2009. And we discovered not only do we buy from people we like in the digital economy, but we buy from people who are like us because there's right. so much choice. So we're looking across that and we're going there. Yeah, I like all that, but they've got red and I don't really like red. And they've got blue, which I really love. And they've got black and I'm not too sure about that and everything. And you end up going with the one that's most like how you see yourself. We call the, that the, the one where you, you can project yourself the most easily effectively yes effectively oh, so you effectively. see yourself in in the image dimensions of that particular business and that can be at an intellectual level can be at a verbal level can be at a kinesthetic level it can obviously be at a visual level there are loads of factors on that so you can manipulate that depending on on that and and, and that comes down to you can't sell to everybody so there's no point in trying you need to yeah uh, and address I, a market who actually Correspond to you. Sorry, go ahead. Correct, correct. And that's why we start at the bottom of the bucket because you don't need to sell to everybody. You need to sell to the people who you need in the bottom of your bucket. And that was so simple and yet genius. <laughs> you don't need anyone else. If you need so you look at the people you've got in your bucket and then you look at the outside world and say, who are the people who look like these people that I've already got in my bucket that, that and aim for those? That can help. Only, but I would only look at the people in your bucket that you like. Because you might have some in there that you don't like, and don't don't get lots of those because you'll just be very upset about that. All right, so you could have a little hole in the bottom of your bucket, and you kind of push people towards it that you don't well, like. Course, the, rea <laughs> the reality is the reason why it's bucket shape is there are leaks at each step, and I'll talk about that in a minute because right. there, there are. Some Am I jumping ahead too fast here? No, no, you're just doing it in reverse, which is very weird for me. I've never done it this way. I'm, I'm quite enjoying it because you keep looking up like that as you're thinking it through I'm backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's like getting somebody to say the alphabet backwards. It is, it is it's exactly like that. You know, so, um, and then the very top level, the very first thing is what we call awareness. So you've got to, you've got to get known um, mm. in, in the marketplace. Now, this, this is where the, the media owners really ply their fraudulent story because they say, ah, oh, well, what you've got to do is you've got to advertise everywhere. You've got a big email blast and you've got to be on – on all Google and you've got to search and you've got to do all your advertising. You've got to be at the exhibition and you've got to, you've got to, you know, place the ads and be on telly and be on YouTube. And then you go, Oh, well, no, 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 we don't actually. We don't. Um, uh, we need to be where our prospects live. And that's the only place we need to be. So the more you know about the perfect prospect that you want, which you've already identified will probably be quite close to the people already in the bottom of your bucket, then you only go to where they are. And then what you do is you build familiarity with them. And the way you do that, lots of ways. You can have a famous name, so you can be Gucci or Chanel or, or, or Sainsbury's or, or, or Walmart or whatever. It really doesn't matter what, what, what the name is, but you need a lot of money to make your name famous. So that's really not available to 99.9% .9 of all businesses. You're not going to get that famous. Can, can you not make your name famous within a very small niche market of yeah, your favorite right. people yeah, from your bucket? Right. In fact, that's exactly what you should do. But ah, let's, brilliant, jolly good. No, absolutely you should do. Um, and you become the, the, the go-to name in that thing. So that's one option. The second thing is you can come up with a natty advertising line. So, you know, we know there's plenty of those. Um, but again, you have to spend money explaining why you have the line and why it links to your value proposition and why it's going to be good and all that sort of thing. So again, it's another, the, the best way is to create what we call a brand property, a something that you have physically owned that relates to your story so i'm i'm famous in in, in the uk for example there is a there is a, a I'll, I'll show it to you i don't know if you you know what this do you know what that is uh it, it, oh hang on it's a tulip no it's uh it's a marigold it's uh it's a rose uh by another name oh it's, that's shakespeare i'm being incredibly intellectual what is it it is a daffodil of course it's a daffodil Go, and boom. it relates it relates to uh, one what's now a top 10 charity in the UK. And we, we, we made that famous and people wear these on their lapels. And we do this right. regularly for, um, so E-Trade, which became the world's largest online broker, we took two converging arrows and we made them into link and, uh, and become an asterisk and things like that. So what I, what I do is I specialize in um, finding a thing or a something that people will recognize so that every time you place it in any of your communication, people go, oh, that must be from that organization there. Can I ask um, a question? Is this red shirt enough? 
the red shirt is not really enough because red, oh. shirt, red shirt isn't particularly unique um, in that sense. You know, now, it has if, to be a physical object. Well, no, it just has to be unique. So if, for okay. example, you had a, 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 a color swatch or something just on one of the one of the collars or something like that. So it was a red shirt with a, a touch of green. And every time I saw somebody wearing a red shirt with a touch of green, I go, oh, that must be. So it becomes a uniform. It, it's it's not quite uniform enough. It doesn't have enough clues on it to make it uniquely yours, if you see what I mean, Joseph. Okay, that's pretty good. You, you may may have guessed what, what my one was. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've, you've, you've noticed that, what my property is. But, uh, Your very small bucket. <laughs> so and I have some very large ones, and I, 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 I for the for the purposes of the tape here, I, I don't necessarily have just a small bucket. The um the but the reality of the reality. Of this, <laughs> sorry, I, well, I didn't mean to offend you. Sorry, I, I didn't really think about what I was saying. Um, but so yeah, my, having a big bucket like this would be would be a bit a bit. Yes, and actually, in in the background there are some buckets of different sizes, and actually people give me buckets. But actually, you're right. Everything I you know. I, when you talk about marketing and buckets, people go, oh, you, "Are you talking about Barnaby?" It's, it's, it tends to be a, there tends to be a link. And also, I know people, but I, I mean, the FedEx logo's got a property in it. Um, you know, the Coca Cola, you can recognise that. So, if you think about the big brands, so you need to do that. If you do that for your business, then you're right. <laughs> you can. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, you, you, <laughs> you need to, um, uh, you know. And I've got a bucket on my my lapel. Can't sit around the wrong way on the camera. Oh right, well. okay. Sorry, I hadn't that, noticed that one. That's from my logo. I mean, you don't need to know because now that this is called rewarded comprehension. Because once you have a property, you can start to place it in clever places, and people suddenly spot it and go, "Well, there, look, there's another one." You know, so and they are reminded of your your particular uh, organization. So it's a trick to get people to concentrate. So then when you're in the the, the grand ether, uh, strategically, every time people see you, hear you, whatever, that little property appears, eventually they, they begin to build familiarity and they kind of feel comfortable and more confident that you're around, you're big. And you're right, if you've not got very much budget and you don't need that many down in the bottom of your bucket, you can be very niche and very egoic about where you place place that property on a regular basis. So the six steps in the correct order. Uh, yeah, I like this because now you can, because we've explained it the wrong way around, you can now go through it the right way around yeah. quickly and it will in make incredible sense to us and but it will be a really nice takeaway. Is you've got to get known, raise awareness. And the way to do that is to use a brand property. Once you get known, you need to wrap that in an image dimension which reflects your prospect's way of thinking, not your way of thinking. That then engages them emotionally. They go, I kind of like you, or like, I've heard of you, I'm familiar with you, and I like the cut of your jib. What is it you do for me? And then at that point, you go into fax match, which is the third step into the bucket where you explain how you're going to benefit them and how you're going to fix their problem and all that sort of thing. They know their problem. You don't have to explain to them they've got a problem. They know that already. <laughs> they go, yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And if you stop there, they go, I've got all the information I require. Uh, when I need somebody like you, I'll come back. And they disappear, at which point all the advertising funkies come in and say, yeah, you've got to keep advertising in case they come back. No, what you should be doing is moving them to the fourth step in the bucket, which is running a test drive, creating a response, say, you know, this is what we do. Would you like to have a go? Yes, I'd love to have a go. Barley, fantastic. And then what happens is they have a go and they really like it and they're enjoying it. And then you go, I'm really sorry. I have to remove this from you now because, because I can't afford to keep giving it to you for nothing. They go, no, 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 you can't do that. I've just integrated it into my system or the way of working or whatever. Don't take it away. You go, no, we have to. We're not a charity. We're not a not-for-profit. We're not a B Corp social enterprise. You know, you know, which I really can't help you. I have to take it away. No, you can't take it away. Oh, there must be something we can do. Yes, there is something we could do. I've just, I've just had an idea. Well, what is it? What's the idea? You give us money and we'll carry on providing the product or service. You go, yes, yes. They don't even ask the price because you're so fully into it. At that point, they give you the money. This is your time to exceed expectation because now they've exchanged their most valuable currency in life, time, in either in the form of money or in the form of time. So you make the experience amazing. We call this usage. So that's step number five. And then, of course, they're using your product. You need, you need to say thank you for using our product, build loyalty, build advocacy, get them to buy more stuff from you. And they're the six steps. Now, what are the numbers? What are the numbers? In what sense? What What's the leakage at each stage? Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. No. Oh, I, I was going to say that was a really, really nice explanation. I actually let you talk for longer than I usually let the guests talk because it was such a nice flow. Now, what what's the leakage, Barnaby? 
I believe it. I'm glad you asked me that question because <laughs> it's such the obvious next question. <laughs> it's the, so if you are planning your campaign, here are the planning metrics. If you want one person, one uh, one buyer in the bottom of your bucket, you need to run between three and five test drives. So, uh, so you're looking for a conversion rate of one in five to one in three. Now, if you find you are converting at worse than one in five, by one in six, one in eight, one in ten, you haven't been tight enough at the top of the bucket to stop people coming into your bucket. You need right. to stop them coming into your bucket. So you need to get much tighter, much more egoic, uh, be much more prescriptive, be much more disruptive and say, we only want certain people with their name on the list to come down into our bucket. So that's the first thing. If you're converting it better than one in three, so you're converting allegedly one in two, or everybody that comes to you. I don't believe you unless you're an undertaker, because as mm -hmm. undertakers, we get everybody in the end. Yeah, that's that's the, it's 100 percent through. Hang on, you just said we. That means you're an undertaker. <laughs> it doesn't. I was pretending. You know. Oh, right, okay. I thought you had a side business in burying people. No side business. No, because then I I would be making a lot of money right now because of uh, because of the pandemic, and I probably wouldn't need to speak to you, Jason. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> that that was very cutting. <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my brand thing, would I? I would be doing something different. So yes. Got... Anyway, so if you're converting better than one in three, you don't you're believe me, or convert between three and five. If you can, if you can improve your conversion rate from one in five to one in four, you can save a third of your marketing expenditure. Third, a third right. of your just by. So if you're finding you're you're outside those parameters. It's worth putting some effort into a better test drive, qual making people qualify to take. To get those people, you need to get 10 times that number of people to ask you what you do, yeah? So 30 to 50 people. So if you get 30 to 50 people to, to, to say, what do you do for me? And you explain how you're gonna benefit them, 10% of those people will say, do you know what, that sounds amazing. You say, ah, would you like to have a go? Yes, we would. And then of those, you convert one right, or two. Okay. And then above the 30 to 50, and this is where it's changed. In, when we when we first created the model in eighty five for SARP, um, there was a fixed number which was ten times that number again, so three hundred to five hundred. So you need to get three hundred to five hundred people into the top of the bucket you know, by raising awareness, creating the right image. Ten percent of them would say, "What what what do you do?" You'd explain, and then that convert. Today, that's your fifty seven percent. So what you're doing now is you're marshalling the 57% into the point where they click on your website and want to buy. And so where marketing's fundamentally changed and where, where your world, Jason, is now what you have to do is have a very clear, distinctive strategy to get the 57% pe people into the point where they say, I'd like to have a go. So that's the difference now today and what's really changed about marketing. And there's a specific strategy for getting the 57% in. And it's a strategy that you have. It is a strategy I have. It's it, I do indeed. Fun enough. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a strategy that you that you will share now, uh, or if you would like me to share it now, Jason, I will share it right now. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm now interested in you sharing it. You've, you you're a very good salesman, Barnaby. I'm <laughs> one of the one the one in five hundred people who gets to the bottom of okay. your bucket, so, as it were. If you are a business, irrespective of whether you sell a product or a service. It is intended that you build a system and process around a core center of expertise. And what's happened now with the knowledge economy and the digital economy is we are all searching uh, all the information that's available to us. And as a result of books like The Challenger Sale, which came out in, in, in some 11 years ago, what that essentially said is people are looking for help in the buying process and the most succinct way of helping people was to give them insight into their problem into the decision they need to make to help them understand the why market because you got you can't visit all a million websites to get the final information you've got to do you've got to you've got to rely on some things so brand owners 11 years ago we started to work with them and say okay you've got to flood the knowledge economy with insight and so you saw the rise of blogs and, and, and posts on Twitter and Facebook posts and all this sort of thing and all this great information. So that, that then led to lots of insight and people being able to make 57%. The problem we have today, and this is Gartner bought CEB, which was the company behind Challenger Sale and Challenger as a customer. 
and did some more research about a year ago, which they started to push out into the market uh, just before uh, lockdown. And so it's, it's still relatively fresh, this. is They identified that when people go online now, broadly speaking, all of the information they, they, they are seeing um, seems to be right. And now they're confused again because now I've got reliable sources who are saying opposing things. So I'm going on, I'm visiting one website, and they go, you should do this. And I go to another website that I used to rely on, and they say, you should do that. And it's quite different. And now I'm confused. So the strategy for getting people to and helping them make the 57% decision is you have to help them make sense of their buying decision. And oh, you yeah. use insight to enable them. Now, you're the expert in whatever field you are. It doesn't, I don't care what whatever business I end up working with, somebody in the organisation that really knows their onions, they know what they're talking about. What you've got to do is take those people and you've got to help them feed the, that top part of the bucket with all of their insight and all their making sense. So actually what you're saying is you're running posts that saying if you're going to, so I, I work with a business that that, um, that uh, builds rooms in the garden, for example. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, bespoke, amazing rooms in the garden. It's doing extraordinarily well right now, as right. you can imagine, because people are working from home. Yeah. Sexy garden sheds, you mean? Really sexy garden sheds. Brilliant. He gets all of his leads from uh, two uh, make sense guides. Uh, I'll call them make sense guides. The first one is 20 amazing buildings to put them at the bottom of your garden. Yeah. And you go through this brochure of things he's done, and they just look amazing. You go, I want one of those, or something like that. And the other one, is how to connect your garden room to the internet. Right. And, and he gets all, all, the, all the clicks to his website come via those two documents. Because what he's doing is he's helping people understand the importance of, of having a room in the garden. And if you've got one already, how you connect it to the internet. Because we've all got sheds and we can all convert them in summer houses. But then we think, well, blow me. How do I get... How do I, my, my, if I'm using a, a, you know, I won't mention any names, but a, a, a mainstream wireless thing, it doesn't go through one wall, let alone it goes down the bottom of the garden, you know. So, how do I connect to that? So, and actually, people suddenly go, do you know what? If I'm going to invest in that, I might as well get a better building or a better something. Like that. It's amazing. Now, what he's doing is helping people in that buying decision make sense of the buying decision. That's what, what we do now with all our clients is we, we, we work with them, we unearth what they're really cool at, what they really understand. Now, it's quite interesting because if you go to the older organisations, they resist. They go, no, no, if you tell people what we know, everybody will know it and then we won't be differentiated. And I go, ah, but you've got to understand you're selling time. Hmm. You're not selling expertise, you're selling time. And then I go through the whole time thing again <laughs> Yeah, no, so that comes out. I mean, Anton's going to absolutely love you because what he's trying to do with the webinars he does with SEMrush and what we're trying to do here is is bring expertise and, and share with people so that uh, ultimately when they need to make that decision about what it is they're going to do or buy, uh, it's easier for them because we've helped them with our expertise. Of course, of course. And they're going to, and in the end, the, the, you don't be shocked if you walk into a room and everybody's wearing a red shirt, Jason, because that's they will have matched to your image. You're not going to get everybody. There's going to be people like your yeah. style, the way you work with the guests, the guests themselves. I, I, I recognize now that I just have to be me. That's all I have to be. Um, and people well, it's, a bit about, it's a bit It's a bit like finding a life partner and getting married. You be yourself. Don't like try to be like anybody else, uh, which is a song. And I'm trying to remember what the song was. I'm not like anybody else. It's a king something, isn't it? Which is the one I remember anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is, uh, but Wonderful it, stuff. Yeah, sorry. You've got one more thing to say? No, no, no. I was going to say, I, 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 think, I think that's why you can be absolutely confident in your own uh, persona if you're a founder of a business that you could that inevitably you've embedded that in all your systems and processes so just explain to people how you fix their problem how you benefit them and then give them a go and you'll be amazed that if you just tell that story and broadcast that story that you're willing to share everything and anything the reality is they're buying from you the time because they haven't got the time to spend every waking hour thinking about it like you have or investing in the systems and processes so they're buying your product and your service, exchanging their, their time currency, which is money, for your time currency, which is your service or your product. 
that it's that's business and that's what Brilliant. this is about lovely that's the one i'm taking away from this i love that it was wonderful went on longer than they usually do but that must be because barnaby winter is so intelligent so interesting and so stunningly good looking <laughs> A quick goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Barnaby. Oh, and next week, Shaina Weisinger, all about social media and how not to sabotage it. Thanks a lot, Barnaby. See you soon. <laughs>